Hi everyone, my name is Matthew Griffin. I'm the CEO and founder of the 311 Institute, a global futures and deep futures think tank, exploring how current and emerging technologies and trends could impact the next 50 years of global business, culture and society. And today I want to introduce you to a very special project of mine, which roughly revolves around the question, can we use artificial intelligence to cram 12 months worth of academic education into just one month for a dyslexic eight-year-old. Now, for those of you that follow me, before I get into that particular project, you know basically that I'm very passionate about education because I think that society has to be founded on two solid foundations. Good education, which actually lasts through the generations, and good health and wellness. Now, if we get those two right, basically, then it makes getting the future right a lot easier for a variety of different reasons. However, when we actually have a look at today's education system, there are way too many parents, teachers, headmasters and mistresses, ministers of education, royal households, as well as billionaire philanthropists that keep asking the question, why is today's education system still rooted in the industrial age? Why are we still teaching children subjects and subject matter that was first put into the curriculum a hundred years ago and hasn't really been updated ever since? Now, for those of you that actually have children going through any school anywhere in the world, it's highly likely that you know what I mean. Now, to put it in the words by of one of the children that I mentor, she asked the question, how come is it that school today teaches us about the past but not the present or the future. And broadly, I actually agree with that. Now, to put it in the words, by see if some of the United Kingdom's premier academic institutions, the headmasters and mistresses that actually run those highly awarded, highly regarded, highly recognized global institutions, they too see a disconnect what is actually being taught within the UK national curriculum, and I see that repeated globally, not just with the UK curriculum, but with global curriculums as well, and the future. With one headmaster recently saying to me, why are we still putting children generally in front of examinations that were set in the 1960s? Why? When we actually have a look at the global rate of technological and political change, we've seen more change in the past 10 years than we have in the past 1,000, 2,000 years. And yet, from an academic perspective, we are still teaching children, very broadly, the same things that I learned, that your grandparents learned, and their great-grandparents learned, all with a drip feed of new theories in areas like science and technology. But when we have a look at the future that we're actually already in today, to go back to that original quote, today basically we live in a world that is increasingly dominated by artificial intelligence, 3D printing, 5G networks, 6G basically is already starting to emerge. We're also increasingly in a world that is dominated not just by one reality, but by multiple realities, augmented reality, virtual reality, and all kinds of other constructs as well. And that's before we get anywhere near Web3 or synthetic biology. When we have a look at the future of computing, we are already on the verge of realizing quantum computing as the next revolutionary quantum computing platform. And that's before we get into neuromorphic computing, chemical computing, biological computing, as we're already seeing on the bench in different UK universities. So if our children are expected to go into just the current day, armed with the skills and the expertise and the knowledge from the past, how is it preparing them for what's coming? When we have a look at the hard skills, the vast majority of multinational organizations that I actually work with, and those multinational organizations include the ones that you are using right now to actually watch this video, 
Even those organizations say that increasingly they are hiring on raw talent and attitude and ability, not necessarily on academic grades. And part of the reason for that is because they actually see an increasing disconnect, an increasing gap between the skills that they need as an employer or employers and the skills, the hard skills that are actually being taught in school and in some cases universities. So with that as a particular backdrop, one of the things that we need as individuals when we're having a look at the future is increasingly because of the rate of change, we need to be able to adapt at speed and we need to be able to learn at speed. And this project that I put together really set out to test whether or not we could actually learn at speed. We talk about upgrading artificial intelligence algorithms, but could we actually ironically use artificial intelligence to upgrade the human learning algorithm? That's it. Some people say, but I say that when we actually have a look at the future, technology has come so far, so fast that it is increasingly exponential. And they also say that when we have a look at the human brain and the human mind, we haven't actually had an upgrade in over 20,000 years. And my answer to that, or my retort to that, is education is our own human brain's upgrade. So let's get into the project. Now, the project involved myself, my 11-year-old son, a computer, a $90 billion artificial intelligence, uh, in fact, a couple of those, and my, at the time, nine-year-old daughter, who was also dyslexic, as it turns out. Now, setting the background for this particular story, when she was seven, she was very heavily bullied at school. So she was bullied for a period of about eight months, despite as parents reporting this time and time and time and time again to the school, the school did respond. They did actually start putting some programs in place to try to curb the bully's behavior, uh, or bull behaviors, plural. Um, however, at the end of an eight month period, the bullying was still happening. And it wasn't just to Pippa, it was to other children, basically in the class as well. And so as parents, we made the very, very difficult decision with Pippa and ultimately with the school as well, to actually move her out of her class, which was year four, in that case, in the UK national curriculum, down to year three. Now, while Pippa loved year three, there were a couple of issues with that. So firstly, a lot of her classmates felt that she'd actually been moved down a year because she was just not academically minded, for example. Um, however, Fast forward 18 months and the school bullies left. One left voluntarily because their parents moved away and the other one was robustly asked to leave, having been robustly asked to leave many, many, many times before. Now, once the bullies had left, Pippa naturally wanted to go back to her old class because she missed her old class. So this kind of gave us a dilemma. On the one hand, basically from her mental health perspective, we felt it was going to be better in both the short term and the longer term if she was reunited with her class, which were going into year five. But it kind of left us with another problem because she was in year three and moving her into year five meant that she would actually need to skip an entire academic year, year four. So with the school, basically, we actually came up with a variety of different options. Now, on the one hand, we could actually, the, the option that we had to try to catch Pippa up to year five was we could either just do nothing and we could move her into year five and then we could let the school try to catch her up, which broadly, because it's a relatively standard school, basically with standard, should we say, resources and so on and so forth, would, we estimated, have taken a year anyway. So by the end of year five, she'd actually be where she needed to be and so on and so forth. However, that came kind of with its own challenges and et cetera, et cetera. Secondly, as parents, basically we thought that over the summer period, we could actually hire uh, private tutors 
However, I do a lot of work in the United States, so in the summer I'm typically over in the United States. Um, and that was quite difficult and relatively impractical for a variety of different reasons. However, being a futurist, I wondered basically if we could actually use a $90 billion artificial intelligence and just my old noggin um, and my 11-year-old son to actually help Pippa catch up. That's what we did. Now, the school, in order to help us in our particular project, basically the school provided me with this. So this is actually the United Kingdom's year four curriculum. Um, and in the curriculum, there are all sorts of things that Pippa had to learn. There are lots of skills, basically, that she had to be capable of you know, mastering and so on and so forth. And it wasn't just enough for her to have knowledge of these particular subjects. She needed to be able to experience them and then replay them in an appropriate way that meant that she really understood the subject matter well. Now, these subjects included English, maths, science, relationships, education and health, uh, music, geography, computing, design and technology, languages, history, physical education, which we didn't actually use the AI for, obviously, and art and design. Now, when we have a look at the results of this project, just skipping ahead slightly, so she does have dyslexia. Um, however, two months into year five, she has got greens, which means that she is actually caught up and she is where she needs to be academically. And this is according to official assessments um, in the vast majority of subjects. The only two subjects that she hasn't actually caught up appropriately are maths and English. Now, maths was a little bit surprising, but AIs aren't really that great at maths at the moment. Conversation for another time. And when it comes to English, the predominant thing that's actually been letting her down is her dyslexia. Because when it comes to spelling, unfortunately, frankly, she's awful at it. Um, and she's very determined to actually get the spellings nailed. Uh, and that's a project that I'm actually still working with her on. And again, we're trying to use artificial intelligence to sort of figure out the best way to actually teach her spellings, basically, that she finds difficult. Um, and frankly, very much work in progress. And I'll come back to you on that. Um, however, uh, as far as success goes, what we did or what we had to do is we had to try to translate the requirements of the year four curriculum into prompts and into a plan that would let Pippa catch up 12 months worth of academia. And to give you a little bit of an example, one of the things she had to learn was she had to learn about electricity and electrical circuits. So we tailored the prompts and you can see this if you sort of follow the videos in this particular playlist you'll see exactly what we did they're unedited and so on and so forth um, but in order to teach her about electrical circuits we said teach pippa a nine-year-old about electrical circuits in the style of a nine-year-old and these ais that we use we used uh, chat gpt we used google bard as well um, would end up coming back saying, well, electrical circuits are a little bit like when you leave your house on your bike and you cycle around the neighborhood and you get back to your house, that is a circuit. And electrical circuits are very similar. Um, we had AI teaching her about conductors. Uh, we had AI teaching her about Roman times and Roman engineering and all kinds of different things. And frankly, I was impressed with the results. And you also have to bear in mind that we're trying to use artificial intelligence as an adaptive AI one-on-one -on -one tutor for Pippa while we were in a foreign country. And while in some cases, she just couldn't be bothered. So we had all of that stuff to actually deal with as well. And so from our perspective, I hope you actually find the sort of the following videos both informative and I hope you're able to actually use them to accelerate your children's own learning and maybe even actually your own learning as well. And when we actually have a look at the future of education, the fact of the matter is, I still think that there is this increasing gap between what, what schools are teaching our children and what the working world, shall we say, is actually requiring from them and or demanding of them. So if you want to check out uh, my views on the future of education and learning and then how we actually help 
ourselves as well as our students actually become more, should we say, future fit, maybe not future ready, that's always a dangerous term, then go to the 311institute.com's website and have a look for the Future of Education and Learning Curriculum uh, and Codex, and you can download it and you can read through it to your heart's content. Um, if you have any questions, do feel free to reach out to me and DM me. Um, it's an area that I'm fascinated by. Um, when we have a look at, for example, Jack Ma, Jack Ma as well, if you know him, he's actually the founder of Alibaba in China. He's actually left Alibaba to go back to being a teacher because, again, he sees this gap as well. If you know the likes of Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, as well as Richard Branson, they are very, very vocal, basically, about this increasing gap. And as I travel around the world, basically meeting parents, meeting, meeting teachers, meeting ministers of education and royalty and all these sorts of other organizations, including many of the world's best and biggest multinationals, I don't actually think that I'm alone in my thoughts that education needs reforming. The subjects that we teach need tweaking. I'm being very diplomatic here. And the things that we actually need to teach our children need to evolve. So we have ways to do that. But unless the governments of all of these individual countries that we live in change the national curriculums, then we are continuously going to be stuck with education that is stuck a hundred years in the past and our children are going to be taking exams that were set in the 1960s and they are going to be learning about things that increasingly have relatively little relevance and again I'm being diplomatic to how the future works, the world that they're going to live in and the workforce that they're going to enter into. So thank you for listening to this and I wish you well. Take care. Goodbye.